I'd like to begin by thanking Sir Henry and the Association of Iranian Political Prisoners and the Prisoners of Conscience Appeal for giving me the honor to share some thoughts with you today about how we can achieve justice in light of the grim realities which uh, Nazanin alluded to in her speech and which we saw in this very moving film um, and the testimonies of our dear brothers and sisters, Daryush, Masood, and Shukufe. First, I'd like to begin by expressing to me what is the most important aspect of this meeting. This meeting is about the triumph of the human spirit. It is about the struggle between light and darkness, the struggle to negate people's inherent dignity and the invincible spirit of those that 21 years after these unspeakable crimes are still here, who speak not only on their behalf, but on behalf of those that are no longer with us to speak. And if there's one thing that has kept me in this very grim business for so long, it's the voice of the victims and the survivors, and their unquenchable uh, call for justice. So I really want to pay tribute to all those that have the courage to be here uh, and to recount uh, profoundly traumatic events. The significance of what happened 21 years ago has to be understood in a broader historical context and we have to understand its immediate relevance to what is happening in Iran today. When I was in Yugoslavia serving with the UN, and I was witness to the ethnic cleansing campaign under Yugoslav President Slobodan Milosevic, one event really captured the consummation of this policy, which is, to quote Hannah Arendt's, terminology, a form of radical evil, an evil which transcends the ordinary evil that we believe human beings are capable of. And that was the mass murder of some 7,000 Bosnian Muslim boys and men in an enclave called Srebrenica in the summer of 2005. And Srebrenica, although it was an event in a specific location which took place over a span of a few days, began to really symbolize the brutality and evil of ethnic cleansing and the leaders that were behind it. The massacres of 1988, I believe, are Iran's Srebrenica. They are not isolated in time and space. They were the consummation of an appallingly brutal period of eight years during which tens of thousands of political prisoners were put to death. And what distinguishes it from all this other brutality is really its scale and gravity. The fact that so many were killed so quickly. And in that sense, we have to understand that what happened 21 years ago is not a distant event but that it is an event which continues to haunt us in the present. It haunts us in the present not just because of the enduring trauma of its victims and survivors and their family and loved ones, and their need to heal and our need as a nation and an international community to come to terms with the truth that has been suppressed for so long, or for us to see as Nozanin said, the human face of the suffering. Yosef Stalin famously said that a single murder is a tragedy, but a million murders is a statistic. 
And we can sit here and talk about whether 3,000 people were killed or 5,000 or 4,000, but the victims are not mere abstractions, they're not mere statistics. And we saw today that behind every one of them, there is a name, there is a face, there is a story, there is a child, a mother, a father, a brother, a sister, a universe of human relations. And only in embracing that intimate reality can we begin to see how truly horrific that crime was. But I'm here not to speak about the victims, but to speak about the perpetrators. And beyond the need for us to heal as a nation, behind our need for truth. When we think about who the perpetrators of these crimes were and where they are today, we begin to understand that this is not merely an event which is a matter of historical curiosity, but it has left a profound imprint on the present nature and constitution of the Islamic Republic. We know that the massacres were the result of a fatwa by the Supreme Leader Ayatollah Khomeini. So we're not dealing here with an aberration. We're not dealing here with a state in which there is respect for human rights and then there was somehow some deviation from that norm in some singular cataclysm. This, as I explained, was an integral part of the policy of terror and intimidation which allowed the regime to perpetuate its own power. But beyond Ayatollah Khomeini, who were those that were involved and where are they today? Well, I'll give you a few examples. Esmail Shushtari, who was one of the members of the so-called Death Commission, that gave the prisoners something which I cannot even begin to call a summary trial. Even in the worst dictatorships, a summary trial has some pretense of legal process. So there is at least half an hour, one hour. We're dealing here with people who are interrogated in a religious inquisition, where in a matter of one or two minutes, their fate was decided. In certain cases, the question was very simple. Are you a devout Muslim? Do you pray? Do you pledge allegiance to the Supreme Leader? If the answer was no, or if the answer was yes, but the interrogator had some doubt, the individual was taken out and summarily executed. Ismail Shushtari, who was one of the members of that death commission, served as the Minister of Justice from 1989 to 2005. Mustafa Pur Muhammadi, another member of the death commission, served as Minister of Interior in the first cabinet of President Ahmadinejad, and today is the senior national security advisor to Ayatollah Khamenei. Ali Bobasheri, another member of the Death Commission, is today the president of the Revolutionary Courts of Iran. Ali Hossein Nayyib, another member of the Death Commission, who was re responsible for issuing the order of the arrest of one of the ladies that's in the audience today, and who's probably responsible for ordering the execution of her husband, is today the Deputy Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of the Islamic Republic of Iran. For those that are unhappy with the House of Lords being a bit conservative, they should take a look at the Iranian judicial system. These are just a small cross-section of those who, instead of being prosecuted for participating in crimes against humanity, were rewarded. Indeed, the right of passage in the Islamic Republic has traditionally been through perpetrating atrocities as a demonstration of one's unquestionable loyalty to the regime. What can one expect from a government that is populated by criminals? A little now about what we mean by crimes against humanity and who can be responsible. And before moving on to that discussion, I should not fail to mention that the President of the Islamic Republic at the time was none other than Ali Khamenei, the present Supreme Leader, who would ultimately have been responsible for this uh, policy of mass murder. 
We speak about crimes against humanity as a political slogan. Crimes against humanity has a very definite legal meaning. Crimes against humanity, as Daryush, if I may call him, uh, by a first name, uh, explained this morning, is a widespread or systematic attack against the civilian population. It is a policy of using murder, torture, rape, unlawful imprisonment, persecution on political and religious grounds against innocent civilians. And the 1988 massacre, and really the policy of the Islamic Republic throughout the past 30 years, I would say, is a textbook example of crimes against humanity. Because we're dealing here with a regime whose very essence is based on the violent imposition of a highly particular interpretation of religion. And I'm amazed time and again as how those on the political left in the West look at the Islamic Republic and defend it as an authentic expression of Islamic identity, not understanding that there are more Ayatollahs, Hojat al-Islams, and clerics who've been murdered and imprisoned and tortured under the Islamic Republic than there ever was under the monarchy. So the question here is about the profane temptations of absolute power and not about the sublime heights of identity and religious belief. And I must express my shock that in this country just a few months ago, on Channel 4, the alternative Christmas message was that of none other than President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. What are you trying to say to the people of Iran that being anti-American is enough of a credential to excuse the most monstrous crimes that are committed against the people of Iran? And if there's one thing that has happened as a result of the recent protests, it is that the people of Iran, a large segment of the population that for many years either did not know that events such as the 1988 massacre have taken place, and we see the great lengths to which the government has gone not to ever admit that this execution took place, and we know that the bulldozer dug up once again the unmarked graves in the Khabarang just very recently. We see here the power of the truth in undoing the misinformation and indoctrination that keeps in place these power structures. We see that in the protests, in some of the stories that Nazanin shared with us, the murder of Neda of Sultan, the tortures and rapes of the prisons, that the people of Iran have finally, finally awakened to what has been going on behind closed doors for 30 years. How can we now move to bring these perpetrators to justice? I'll begin by sharing a story with you from the days when I entered the War Crimes Tribunal in The Hague as the first prosecutor. Now many people look at this as a very sort of glamorous thing. They say, oh my goodness, you did such a historic thing. Well, I can tell you that when I entered that tribunal, I thought I was a fool. And the last thing that was going on through my mind was that I would do something historic because Slobodan Milosevic, the architect of ethnic cleansing, was firmly in power. And all of the Western democracies who at the same time as they were condemning the ethnic cleansing were actively doing business with them. Many of you will know about Douglas Heard and how the conservative government for long had very warm relations with the Milosevic regime and how the government of the time blocked every attempt to confront the uh, architects of ethnic cleansing. The point was that people told us that we were fools and naive uh, imbeciles for ever thinking in view of what they called power realities that these individuals would ever be brought to justice. And I begin with this because it seems quite hopeless today when we see the unrelenting brutality of the regime just as a space was open 